Our program tonight, Meteor Craters of Iowa, is our guest is Dr. Ray Anderson. He's the adjunct professor at the UI Earth and Environmental Studies Department, as well as my former next door neighbor. So he volunteered and I took him up on it. Um, he has all sorts of other titles, but I'm going to let him explain that. Um, we do have other summer reading program events coming up. That's what's over there on the wall or on the counter, so take your pick. But as for now, I'm going to let Ray talk to us about meteor craters in Iowa. Thank you, Beth. Uh, one of the other titles that I have is I was a geologist with the Iowa Geological Survey for about 40 years. And as such, I got to work on a lot of interesting program projects. Uh, uh, I was very interested in geology, but perhaps the most interesting one was studying the Manson impact structure. That's one of two meteor craters that we, we have in Iowa. Uh, here we are right here in Iowa City, and Manson is right up there, kind of on the northwest part of the state. The other crater is under the town of Decorah, and that's really only been uh, identified as an impact crater for maybe the last six or seven years and I've been retired for five and so I haven't really worked on that too much but of course I'm quite interested in it so I've followed it and uh, these these both have just wonderful stories associated with them so let's uh, let's start out with Manson here that's about 155 miles away from us which is a, a pretty fair piece this is an old Skylab photo. Back when Skylab used to go around the Earth at an angle, that's why the photos kind of tipped. But uh, at the time, we were just trying to understand what Manson was, and I, I drew a line around it uh, that is actually the limits of the crater as we, as we know it today. So it's a pretty big crater. Uh, if you look at uh, kind of a grid pattern that you see in here. That's the state's one mile grid pattern. So there's a mile between each of those, those lines. So the crater is pretty good size. It's 23 miles in diameter. And uh, it incorporates a lot of towns. Right now, the one that's closest to uh, the crater itself is the town of Manson, and so that's what gets its name for it. But if people want to actually see the center of the crater, I usually send them up to this nice little prairie here, which is about a mile away from where the actual center of the impact would have been. So uh, it's quite an interesting place. Well, you say you've been up in that area and you haven't seen any, oh, I forgot to say, it's the 25th largest known impact structure in the world. So it's a pretty good size one. You say you've been up there and you haven't seen any craters, huh? Well, this is what the landscape looks like up there, a little newer photo. This is a Google Earth photo, and that's the limits of the crater. This is, in fact, there really isn't a crater. That's why we call it an impact structure. If it was a crater, it'd be a hole in the ground. If the hole gets filled in, then it's an impact structure. So this is an impact structure. Uh, and it's in one of the flattest areas of the state of Iowa. This is what I call my scenic overview of the Manson Crater. <laughs> this is about what you see when you go up there. Uh, if you look at the geologic map of Iowa, you see the, uh, the quaternary map. You'll see this Des Moines lobe here is the most recent geologic feature in Iowa. That's the latest glacier that moved into Iowa. So it came into Iowa about 15,000 years ago or so and left about 12,000 years ago. So that's not long enough for the landscape to be really eroded and uh, it's a lot of streams cut into it and stuff. So that's why that area is so flat. And, uh, and that hides the crater. This is a, a sort of a shaded relief map of Iowa. You can see how flat that area is. Uh, we've really known about the, that there was something weird going on geologically in that area since about 1905 when the town of Manson drilled their first water well. We didn't have any geologists around there to observe that, nor did they take any, collect any samples or make any logs or anything. But uh, in 1912, one of the Iowa survey geologists, Norton, went up there and talked to all the locals and got an idea of, uh, of what exactly they encountered when they drilled this well. No rock of any kind to a depth of 1,000 to 50 feet. And that is really unusual. And at that point, water came out in great volumes. 
Well, uh, Norton realized, even though he didn't understand a whole lot about the geology of Iowa in that time, he realized that that was really anomalous. Literally construed, he said, this log would revolutionize the current conception of deep geology in the region. And what he was saying is we expect a glacial till on top like that, like we have, but below that we have limestone, shale, sandstone, Pennsylvanian age rocks, more sandstone and shale, all the way down to, to uh, at least as he understood it then, about 2,500 feet. Uh, so, you know, this doesn't fit at all. There's no limestone. There's all this material that is, was called, called clay and then the sand out there. So uh, that is really pretty weird. And then he went on to talk about that very bottom unit, that little red line you, you see up there. That was called, that's granite. Granite is the hard igneous rock. That would be expected to be seen down there somewhere around 2,500 feet or so, not up at 1,050 feet. So uh, he said there's really no explanation for how that granite would have gotten that well. So that was a mystery for a lot of long time. On top of that, the water that they got out of the well, and it flowed in abundance out of that bottom layer. The water was quite a bit different than other uh, aquifers or bedrock uh, wells in the state. So if you look at the average of what you see for the chemical quality of the Manson well versus the average of the nine other deep wells kind of in that general area, what you find is the Manson well is higher in sodium and potassium, a little higher, but it's really higher in chlorine. And it's much lower in these things like calcium, magnesium, bicarbonate, sulfate. Those are the things that make water hard. So what they have here is the only rock water in the state of Iowa that's naturally soft. So that is pretty weird. So nobody understood that for, for quite a while. And then uh, in 1953, the U.S. Geological Survey, which has an office downtown, uh, and they're a water resources branch. Their job is to understand water. So they got kind of curious in this, and they teamed up with the Iowa Geological Survey and went out there and drilled a few wells just to see exactly what's going on. Well, they drilled cores, little cylinders of rock. And uh, this is sort of the state-of-the-art drilling machine that they had back in 53. We, we do a lot better now. But uh, they drilled, the, the punched the first hole down, and uh, they came up with this kind of material. Now, we just kind of call these things by their generic names. What are they composed of? This is a clay-rich sedimentary class breccia. A breccia is a rock that's made up of broken up pieces of rock, not rounded, broken up pieces of rock. Each of those pieces are called class, and these are class of mostly sedimentary rocks. So it's a sedimentary class breccia, and all around it is clay. So it's a clay-rich sedimentary breccia, just a very generic explanation. That sample came from 326 feet, and they got down to about 350, and the well kept collapsing and caving in, so they had to abandon it. And they gave up on that stuff, and they moved over a couple miles and drilled another well. Well, this well right away ran into this other material. This is also a breccia made of broken up rocks, except these are crystalline class. This is the granites and the gneisses and the kind of crystalline rocks that we expect down below two, 3,000 feet, not at 129 feet from the land surface. So this was pretty weird. And as they drilled down deeper, they ran into even larger blocks of this material. This is just a nice, uh, a nice uh, banded, metamorphic rock, and if you found that uh, up in Lake Superior region, you'd think it's perfectly normal rock to be up there, but not here in Iowa. So uh, right away the interpretation was that this was a volcano, and this is kind of a stupid interpretation because there's nothing about those rocks that look like a volcano, but they look like they might have been hot at one time. So this is what they thought. This is a volcano, but don't worry, it hasn't erupted in 100 million years. Well, that's a pretty good guess, actually. Uh, 1955, a student at the University of Iowa did his master's research looking at this crater. And what he did is he took a series of water wells that were drilled in that area and uh, looked at each of them and then drew a line of profile along them and made this cross section. So as if you cut along that red line straight down, flipped it up sideways, this is what he saw as those wells went down. Number one, number two, number eight, that's normal geology, just exactly what you uh, expect. But inside of those orangey lines, uh, the, the geology was quite different. Ran into what he called Cretaceous sediments and then crystalline rocks. 
So his interpretation of this whole thing was that this was a cryptovolcanic feature. Now, they didn't know much about meteor impacts back in 1953, and uh, they probably would have never called something that. A cryptovolcanic feature is like a giant gas explosion or something. Uh, they exist, but nowhere near this big. So this would have been really unusual if that's what it, what it really was. And this is how these cores that were drilled from the, the two cores in the center there, the yellow dots, would fit into that. This also gave us uh, our first real illustrated shape of what the, he thought the crater looked like. So it's not quite round, uh, but, but it's getting there. The next real step in understanding what was going on there was in 1966 when this fellow, uh, Dr. Nicholas Short from uh, University of Houston wrote this paper, Shock Processes in Geology. Here he identified features in rocks that proved they were of, of uh, meteorite origin. And some of the rocks that he used to study were rocks that were recovered uh, from Manson by that 53 drilling program. Now this is a thin section of rock, so this is where you take the rock, cut it real thin, mount it on a glass slab, grind it down to almost nothing so light goes through it, put it under the microscope, there's a millimeter scale so you can see. And what that yellowish thing there is, is that's a quartz grain from Manson. Now normally a quartz grain would look something like this under a microscope, it's even got a Q on it so you can identify it. This doesn't have a Q, but we know what it is anyway. <laughs> anyway, uh, see, it doesn't have those lines in it. Those, really, those, those lines are incredibly distinctive. There's what we call parallel deformation features, or PDFs. And uh, nowadays, when we see those things in a rock, that is considered, if you find them going two different directions like that, that's considered definitive evidence of a meteor impact. That, nothing else on Earth can do that. And what causes that is when the shock wave created by the blast of the meteorite exploding when it hits goes through these rocks, it actually slides the quartz grains along their crystallographic axes with so much energy that they actually melt along there. So those red areas would be melted zones, zones of glass basically. And uh, in the case of Manson, that's enhanced because this whole thing underwent a big hydrothermal pulse. A bunch of hot water came up through everything afterwards. And it sort of etched that glass, and it left behind a lot of these little things called fluid inclusions. They're exactly that. They're little spheres of the, of the hot fluid that moved through them. So that makes it even easier to see those PDFs. And boy, those things are everywhere in these rocks. Well, I said that was considered definitive evidence of impact, and, and this little chart shows you how. This field here in green is basically the combination of pressure going that direction in, in, uh, in a logarithmic scale and temperature that way in a logarithmic scale. So this is all of the possibility combinations of temperature and pressure that you can find on Earth. Uh, volcanoes, uh, earthquakes, anything like that all fall within that field. And over here is where you see shocked quartz. It takes an order of magnitude. Oh, gee whiz. Found out what that one does. <laughs> takes an order of magnitude more energy to, or more pressure to create shocked quartz than is possible on the Earth. So nothing on Earth can create that. Now, we can do that with atomic bombs now, but we, but we couldn't back then. Okay, so here's a geologic map of Iowa that came out not too long after, after uh, Professor Short did his work. Uh, so we know that Manson's a, a crater, at least he knows, uh, and they mapped it as a little more circular feature right there, except if you look on their legend, instead of calling it a crater, they call it the Manson Anomalous Area because they weren't quite sure what was going on there, and that, that's probably a good, safe thing to do. The next real uh, step forward in understanding what was going on was in 1980 when these guys, Luis Alvarez on the left is a Nobel laureate physicist at the University of California, Berkeley at the time. His son, Walter Alvarez, is a geologist there. Well, Walter was studying this thing called the, the KT boundary. It was called Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary at the time. 
Uh, that's a boundary between two geologic units, and here's shown exposed uh, in Denmark, Cretaceous rock at the bottom, and what was called the tertiary at the time at the top. So now the geologists have redone the terminology a little bit, so that's called a paleogene instead of tertiary, but it's the same thing. Lots of times you hear about KT boundary, and what they mean is this one. Well, he's studying that boundary, and particularly that little, little dark, shown up as that dark line right there between those units. That boundary line is called the fish clay locally because all it is is a clay with a few fish bones in it, no other fossils. Down below, good limestone, lots of limestone producing organisms living in there. Up above, good limestone, lots of limestone producing organisms. But right there, nothing. What happened? Well, that's pretty significant also because that boundary also marks a great extinction event. 90% of all marine animals or marine species died off at that time. 70% of all terrestrial species died off at that time, right at that boundary where that little clay unit was. Uh, what in the world caused that? What caused such a dis disruption in everything? Well, you know, that's what uh, Walter was asked, working on, and he wondered how much time was involved in that little, little mechanism, whatever it is, that little black line where his fingers are there. And his dad suggested, well, let's look at iridium. Walter said, iridium? <laughs> well, iridium is a platinum group element. It fits in with some of these other platinum group metals there. Uh, it's extremely rare on the Earth's surface. Concentrations in average rocks is one from one to two parts per billion. In sedimentary rocks, only a 0.05 parts per billion. However, if you look at meteorites, you find it's much, much more, 500 times. Well, the Earth originally had that, that amount of iridium too, but it went down to the core with a lot of the iron uh, when the Earth's core developed. So the surface doesn't have much. So he figured, these little micrometeorites have been raining down on the Earth through time, uh, and they still do today. They come down very small, burn up in the atmosphere, fall as a little bit of dust. Uh, we get an average of about a shoebox an acre that falls today, and it's been apparently about that same way all through geologic time. So if you know how much iridium is there, you know how much time was involved in depositing it, since they know the rate. Well. When they got looking at a couple of the boundaries, they found out that there's 10 to 60 times more iridium that could possibly be explained by that, that short a period of time. So something had to come related to that and deliver a big shot of iridium to Earth. That's when they published this paper, An Extraterrestrial Cause for the Cretaceous Tertiary Extinctions. And what they were proposing was that a large meteorite crashed to Earth, brought all this iridium down, spread it all over the Earth in one big filed swoop. To get that much iridium, based on the concentrations they looked at, or spread over the whole Earth would require something on the order of 200,000 tons of iridium, which is a lot of iridium. That would have taken an asteroid with normal iridium concentration somewhere between 6 and 14 kilometers in diameter. So that is a big thing, smacking into the Earth. That thing would have hit the Earth probably at about 45,000 miles an hour, which is an average speed for, for asteroids hitting the Earth. <laughs> would have blasted a crater about 125 miles in diameter. That's a big one. Not only that, that crater would have thrown enough dust into the atmosphere to block out sunlight so that we'd have a maximum brightness of about 10% of the light of a full moon. Think of a full moon day, about a 10% of that. That'd be the maximum brightness we'd have for about a two year period. So they went on to rationalize. That would kill off all the plants, the photosynthesizers, no sun, no photosynthesis, and the animals that ate the plants would die, and the animals that ate the animals that ate the plants would die, et cetera, and you'd have a big extinction event. Well, geologists were a little weird thinking about that because we hadn't thought about anything so dramatic happening uh, in geology. Plus, we couldn't find the crater. We got looking around for meteor craters, right age in that size. Boy, there was nothing. What does that mean? The crater was either destroyed or not yet discovered, or maybe it's somewhere in the, in the ocean there, or maybe it's a lot of smaller craters. 
About that same time, people were studying the actual deposits of this material where you can see the KT boundary materials that, that, that were being deposited, like that fish clay that was being deposited in the ocean uh, in the southern part of the United States, southwest. Uh, a lot of these materials are being deposited on land, and so they're studying these. This is a typical example of one of the KT or KP boundaries that you see now. This is in Southern California or Colorado, uh, right near the Raton Pass. What you see, that white, that little white band there and that little orange band above it are impact materials. Those are the materials that were deposited at the time of that impact. Instead of the fish clay on land, we have that. So, so if we take a little closer look at it, there's an ejecta layer and a fallout layer. And uh, if you zoom in on those a little bit, you can see them a little more clearly. The ejecta layer is like a white clay, and the fallout layers is kind of various colored things with various sizes of things in it. Well, what are these things, and how do they relate to the KT impact? Well, this is what the ejecta layer would have looked like. That meteorite hit, it would have melted so much rock and splashed it like a giant wave of molten rock. And uh, by the direction that the meteorite came in, apparently it splashed most of that material up over North America. And we see that ejecta layer over, over virtually all of the uh, uh, southern part of North America. I mean, not, maybe not, not into uh, northern Canada, but otherwise in that area. So that's the ejecta layer. And you can imagine a, a big layer of molten glass coming down on that. That would be pretty bad on dinosaurs and things like that. But then all the material that was thrown higher up into the atmosphere slowly rained down. And this included the vaporized meteorite. So that's where the iridium anomaly came in. You see the iridium there. Uh, plus a lot of earth material vaporized. This has rained down as so many micrometeorites. Now you know what a meteorite, when, it's, when it flashes through the sky, it leaves a little trail of, of light. Well, there's a lot of heat associated with that too. So all of these things falling down and through the atmosphere heated up the atmosphere to a temperature of about 2,700 degrees. So by the time it got down to land surface here, pretty much everything on Earth burned up at that time. And there seems to be pretty good evidence that virtually anything that would burn on the surface of the Earth burned at that time. So we've got molten glass being splashed on you, and then you're being cooked like being in the broiler of your oven for several hours. You know. It's amazing anything survived that. About that same time, people studying that, that boundary uh, in the Raton Basin found this. Quartz, shocked quartz. Again, that just helps to prove that a big impact is what caused all of that. But it also tells us something more. If we look at the Earth, we have basically two types of crust on the Earth. We have oceanic crust, which is shown in blue here, and continental crust, which is shown in the orangey color. Now, quartz is found in only in great abundance on the continent. That is the only place you can find quartz. You don't find it in the ocean. So that pretty much rules out an ocean impact. It had to be an impact on land somewhere. But where? Well, the same guy, Bruce Bohor, from the US Geological Survey, uh, he went around and looked at these KT boundaries uh, and, on land and some in the ocean, wherever he could find them, and looked for the biggest piece of shocked quartz he could find. And this map shows the distributions of the continent at that time, at the time that meteor hit. And where these sites he looked at, the numbers, the largest uh, quartz grain, shocked quartz grain he could find in, in millimeters. So where's the largest one? Right there, that right tall and pass. And like anything else, you'd expect the bigger ones to be closer to the actual source of the meteor. So uh, we knew it had to be somewhere close. Actually, it ended up being right there on that little peninsula of Michigan, the, or of Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula. Well, uh, we liked the idea of a lot of little craters. And our crater was about the right age. And uh, we thought, well, we can get a little mileage out of that. If we can get people thinking that this might be related to the KT, then uh, maybe somebody will come in and do some drilling, and we can learn some more about it. And, uh, and sure enough, that worked. I was giving a paper out in uh, Colorado at a meeting. And a uh, guy from Amico came by and said, how'd you like a seismic profile across that crater? I said, well, I'd like that a lot. <laughs> And uh, it turns out that they had been shooting some seismic around craters because some craters have oil in them. And they had shot a seismic line across Manson, and he gave that to us. 
Now what that is, is, is that's where they have those trucks that put a, put a sound wave or a pulse down into the ground and have a bunch of microphones and record the reflection of that pulse off of all the various geologic materials. Then it goes into a computer and crunches for a long time and you come out with something like this, which shows those little reflectors. Well, that doesn't look like much, you know, but to, to geologists that have studied it, this is really good because this is really what it shows you here. It shows normal rock sequence out in here. These are the layered rocks, the limestone shales, et cetera, that we normally find in Iowa, sitting on top of this thick clastic basin. This is an old Precambrian uh, basin that dipped down in this direction here. So uh, that's a general dip. So everything looks pretty normal there. And down below are these crystalline rocks, the granites and gneisses, et cetera. Well, once you get to about this point here, everything gets all wacky. These pieces are dropped down and lifted up and all scrunched around. And then you get to this line here and everything is totally different. Then if you look at this Precambrian surface, it's climbing upward slowly out of the basin and it's disrupted by all this up and down stuff. Then it shoots right up to the surface. Well, we recognize this right away. This is a classic complex impact structure. So if I take that, that seismic line and flip it over so I can see the other half. I can draw a profile right across the crater. Uh, typical complex impact structure. And I'll show you what, th what that means. A simple crater, a simple impact structure, looks like meteor crater here. It's about a mile, mile across or so. Just a big bowl blasted out of the ground. But when you get too much bigger than about three mile diameter crater, then things change. What happens is you, you blast a hole out of the ground just like you would in a normal crater, except as this pushes out, it's pushing out with so much energy that it lifts up the edges of the crater, so they get lifted way up like this. Then as the energy starts to dissipate, those edges of the crater, the uplift edges, collapse downward and focus all of their pressure toward the center, and it pops up the center just like that. So you get a central uplifted block and a series of down drop blocks around the side. The analogy is really just like a drop of water falling in a puddle. And I've got a little computer simulation here that shows you a little bit of that. Uh, start out with a normal crater, blast a hole in the ground, you see the edges are lifted up, and when the energy dissipates enough so it can't hold those edges up, then they collapse downward and push up a central peak. And this is what happened to the case of Manson, and it collapsed part way down. And that's about where we're at with Manson. Now, as craters get bigger, there's more energy, and that central peak gets higher, and this whole thing may continue. That may continue to sink down, and then you'll end up with what's called a peak ring. And sometimes, the very biggest craters, may, that may bounce up and down two or three times. You have multiple peak rings. So this is what we have in Manson. Uh, here's a crater on the moon that's uh, strangely about the same size as Manson. And if you look at it, it's got a terrace terrain there, those down drop blocks that slid down that were originally uplifted. And the area we call the central peak in the middle where it's lifted up, in between them we call that the crater moat. Uh, just use that term because it would have been like a castle if this blasted on land. You'd have had a circle of water around that central peak like a castle moat. So there, there you go. There's the one on Mars that looked just like Manson. And uh, if you've ever seen Meteor Crater, remember it's a mile in diameter, Here's a crater here that's the same size as Meteor Crater, and you compare that to the size of Manson. So if you've ever been to Meteor Crater, this is way, way bigger. Well, we decided we'd study a little more about this crater, and so we, we restudied all of the wells that were available. Since this is a long time, since 1953, uh, a lot more wells available, a lot more well information available. And so we were able to map out nice circular features like that with the down drop terrace terrain, the uplifted central peak, and the areas in between. So could Manson really be related to the KT boundary? Is it the right age? Well, that Cretaceous Paleogene boundary has uh, been measured at 65.5 plus or minus 3 million years. MA is mega annum, million years. OK, so what about Manson? Well, we know the rocks that were blasted into were 100 million years old. So the crater is less than 100 million years old. And the only thing we know on top of these rocks right now is glacial till. So that came in about 2.5 million years. So in between was a period of erosion. So we've got it bracketed between 1 billion, or between 100 million and 2.5 million. And 65.5 fits in there real well. So maybe this is a crater related to the 
the Cretaceous tertiary boundary and the extinction of all those animals? Maybe. Well, about that same time, the U.S. Geological Survey was trying to do a real radiometric age on the Manson rocks. That's where you take and you look at the chemistry of the rocks themselves, and sometimes uh, you get a radioactive rock like uranium. Uh, it decays into other things, for instance, lead and things like that. So if you find a uranium atom that's sealed inside something else so that none of the daughter products got away, you can measure that proportion and find out how old that rock is. And that's a technique known as argon 4039 age dating. And uh, a series of these dates were done by the U.S. Geological Survey, and they came up with an age of 65.7 for the Manson Crater, an age that he said is, is indistinguishable from recent estimates for the age of the KP boundary. So there was some person that thought that the Manson Crater was the right age. Well, that information, along with uh, us being acquainted with Gene Shoemaker, who's daughter lives here in town, as a matter of fact. Jean is, was the number one geologist for the U.S. Geological Survey at the time. This is the Shoemaker of Shoemaker-Levy uh, comet that hit, hit Jupiter. Uh, very, very famous guy, very nice guy, and I got him to uh, put the arm on the U.S. Geological Survey and get him to give us a little money so that we could join with the, with the Iowa Survey, could join with them and do some research drilling. So in 91 and 92, we drilled a series of holes with the primary goal being to try to get a more accurate age date, get a little better rock to do the age date on than the one that was done. To identify the type of impactor, do we think it was an asteroid? Was it a stony asteroid or an iron asteroid? Might it have been a comet? Who knows? Maybe we can get some information on that. And finally, to compare the target rocks to other rocks that are found at the KT boundaries around the world. So this threw a lot of rocks out of the crater, and they came down over there. Are the rocks that came down over there the same as the ones at Manson? So that was the goal of the project, and uh, we managed to drill a number of holes. We drilled 12 all told. Uh, total of 5, 000, almost 5,000 feet of drilling, almost 3,000 feet of that was core that we recovered, so we did really well and got a lot of good information. And it was drilled mostly along that seismic line that Amico gave us, that's shown in red there, because there we had best, better control on how deep we might want to find what, uh, and we could also check our interpretations of what we thought that seismic line was telling us. So that worked pretty good. And uh, what we found out was that there was uh, six types of, of what we call impact materials present at the crater. Now this is kind of a schematic cross-section along that line, seismic line there, showing the central peak, the, the crater moat area, and the terrace terrain, and the kind of rocks we found on there. Not drawn to scale at all. Now what this would have been is the impact would have blasted a crater like this, and uh, these rocks would have been below that crater floor. The crater floor would have been melted mostly, and then these rocks would have been broken up pretty badly, and these broken up not quite so badly. So then that whole thing got shoved up when the central peak popped up. Somehow or other, these rocks that are called Phanerozoic class breccias came in, and then this weird unit, the Keweenaw and Shale breccia, came in. And we don't quite know how all that what came down, but we've got a few ideas, and I'll, I'll show you what we think. So here's the relationship of these particular impact rock units. Uh, they're not all the same thickness like that. In fact, if you looked at thickness, it would look something like this, just a little thin skim of these other ones over this big crystal and mega block things. But this is easier to show. So let's start out looking at these proterozoic megalo meg yeah, proterozoic crystal and mega blocks. Mega blocks. That's easy for me to say. What that means is proterozoic rocks, these are the granites and gneisses. It should be way down there. Uh, crystalline rocks, granites and gneisses, and they're mega blocks, giant blocks, you know. What do they look like? Well, we have a few drill examples of that. And if you were to look at these cores normally, you'd say, oh, there's nothing wrong with those cores. They don't look like they're meteor crater cores to me. Uh, and they do. They look pretty normal, like, except for this. If you got looking at that, that's a little band of what's called pseudotacolite, when one rock is rubbed past the other with such energy that it actually melts in between, so that black is melted glass. That's a little weird. You don't normally find that, but you can. But if you look at these rocks under a microscope in thin section, and you don't skip past the slide, this is what you see. 
Quartz grains are all shocked. Every single one of them in those rocks is shocked, They'll just like that, really beat up. And lots of other rocks are just, just beat all to heck. Above that, we find what we call the crystalline class breccia with the sandy matrix. Essentially, that is this same material here, except it's closer to what was the crater floor at the time, so more energy hit us, so it got broken up into smaller pieces. And you can see that if you look at, at the rock itself. You see a lot of little pieces. And again, these are crystalline rocks, so we'll call this a crystalline class breccia with a sandy matrix, a lot of little sand-sized pieces broken up all around it. Look at that under a microscope, and that's what exactly what you see. Every one of these brown crystals here are quartz grains, and they're all shocked. And uh, this is a horn blend. It's got some fracture marks in it, too. This whole thing is really boogered up. No, right away, that's an impact rock. Above that, the crystalline class breccia with the melt matrix. Well, this was a part right near the crater floor where it was really the hottest. So most of the melt. Most of the rocks melted. Those little particles all melted. A few bigger ones, maybe not. But uh, this is what that looks like. I've got some uh, samples of some of these cores up here, by the way. And, and after we're done here, you're welcome to come up and take a look at them. They're really, really pretty neat. Uh, so this is an example of what those rocks look like. And if you look at them in thin section, wow. See all these melty things, those, those little white things there? Those were quartz grains that were melted and kind of stretched out around. Uh, a few grains that weren't melted. This one here is a quartz grain that wasn't melted. Uh, the edge of it was. You see that white around the edge is melting, and all of this thing is all fractured and broken up. Uh, it's really boogered up. So that's the, that's the melt rock. But also in there, we found some of this material, sanidine. This is a material they were looking at to find the actual age date. This is a feldspar that actually quenched from molten rock. So it was melted originally and then formed another feldspar crystal. So basically when it formed that new feldspar crystal, uh, bits of uranium that were trapped inside of that were sealed in there. So as that radio uranium decayed, the parent and daughter products were trapped inside that crystal. So we can crack open that crystal and measure the parent daughter products and know how long that, hap that was melted which gives us an accurate impact age for Manson. On top here is the stuff we call Keweenawan Shale Breccia. This is uh, pretty weird. Uh, Keweenawan is a geologic period of time. It's a billion years ago. And these are rocks that uh, we see exposed up around the Lake Superior area. And it's a shale, so it's Keweenawan Shale, and it's broken up. It's a breccia. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's a combination of, of chunks of shale like this and chunks of melted shale. This was melt rock, basically, melted shale, all mixed together in a, mat in a matrix that's made up of smaller pieces of the same. So this is pretty weird. It's melted shale and unmelted shale, and what's it doing there? Well, this is what the geology looked like at the time. This was a this is where the meteorite came in, right here. So they have a basin that's dipping off to the, to the east there. That shale unit is right near the bottom of that. Now the meteorite came in, blew a crater out. Whoops, get back there. Blew a crater out that big. So, you know, there isn't, all that shale there is gone. That's melted and vaporized and thrown out of the crater. So it's not there. So how's it going to end up on top of the central peak? Good question. Uh, we know it looks something like this. There was this big blast, and then as the, as the sides collapsed, the central peak came up, all of a sudden there's this Keweenaw shale on top. We still don't know how it got there. I, I got a feeling that with all of this scrunching and stuff around, a piece of it just might have gotten squeezed and kind of popped up there or something. I, I don't have a better explanation. That's one of the biggest mysteries left uh, in understanding this crater. This material is called the Phanerozoic breccia. Basically, covers everything in the crater. This is again a breccia, broken up pieces of rock. Phanerozoic are, are the kind of rocks that we normally see around Iowa: the sandstone, shales, limestones, etc. Uh, the younger rocks, and there's mostly sedimentary rocks. And uh, this thing is dominated by class of those kinds of rocks. So what could that be? Well, what we did is we looked at all the large class, all the ones we could identify by looking at them just by eye and with a, with a hand lens. And we made a list of all these types of rocks to see what percentages of rocks we had. 
So this is a little sort of a sketchy log of the hole. The Cretaceous rocks are on the top. There's just a kind of a thin skin of them. Then there's these blue Paleozoic rocks. Then we get down into these red clastic units. These are Precambrian age rocks. And then the crystalline rocks are, are red and they're Precambrian also. So that, that's about what you see. And what we saw when we put a pie diagram together with this composition is that it's dominated by the shallowest of these units with uh, lesser amounts of the next farther down and lesser amounts yet of the next farther down and just a little skim of the deepest stuff. So that's a kind of strange composition. How did that get there? So we went casting around through all the literature to try to find if somebody has seen an impact structure somewhere else with this material. And uh, sure enough, the Reese Crater have a material called Bunta Breccia. So here's another log of the Reese crater. It isn't as deep as Manson, different materials, but I color coded them according to depth and the proportions are, are pretty similar. So what you see is the same thing. It's just dominated by the shallowest with lesser amounts of the, the deeper and lesser yet of the most deep stuff. So that's pretty weird. What's a Bunta breccia anyway? What is it? Um, what it is is what's called a surge deposit. When the crater hits, this big blast of energy comes off and it moves along and rips up the, the surface of the landscape and they get mixed with things that are thrown out of the crater. Some are big enough to cause a little secondary impact and throw some more material out. All that stuff gets mixed up and thrown outside of the crater. So if we look at the Reese crater, the Bunta Breccia is shown as, as yellow here. This is the part of the crater here that was blasted out, so there was nothing in it. All this stuff was thrown out to the side, so the surge deposit is all around the outside of the crater. Well, that's not what we see in Manson. Oh, geez. That's not what we see in Manson. We see that that, that Bunta Breccia type material, the Phanerozoic class Breccia, covers the entire crater. So uh, how can those be the same type of material? Well, here's what we think it happened. That was an impact in a shallow ocean. The blast of the impact basically evaporated or pushed the sea back so that there was an area of, of uh, dryish land there. And that, that Bunta Breccia type material, the surge deposit built up on that area there. Then after the energy was dissipated, the water came rushing back in and picked up all that material and carried it back into the crater and dumped it in there covered the whole crater. This is a material uh, called a resurge deposit. The surge deposit is resurged back. And uh, that is known from other craters, craters that are smaller that are, are impacts on continental shelves and stuff, stuff like that will display this kind of material. So that's what we think we have is a resurge deposit there. After a period of erosion, this is kind of what we look like uh, at Manson today. We call it the Phanerozoic class breccia. And that covers almost all the crater. This is, uh, if we stripped away all the glacial till and looked at just that first rock unit there, what we'd see is most of the crater is covered with this resurge deposit, this Phanerozoic class breccia. Just a few places there, it's eroded down enough to cut through that stuff. So that crater is pretty much in intact. There's very little erosion on it. It's a very pristine crater. One other thing I haven't talked about here is this unit off on the side here that we call the overturned sedimentary strata. And we drilled a hole down there, our M4 hole, uh, core hole through there, and this is what we got. Uh, we passed through the glacial till and then through that resurge Phanerozoic class breccia material. Then we went into these Proterozoic red clastics, and these guys are a billion years old. We went down through that into the Cambrian age rocks, they're 500 million into the Ordovician age rocks, or 450 million, and then finally into the Devonian age rocks that are somewhere around 375 million. Well, what's wrong with this picture? It's upside down. I mean, the younger rocks get deposited on top, not on the bottom. So, so how is this formed? Well, it turns out this is something that we see a lot in a lot of other craters too, including Meteor Crater. It's called an overturned flap. As the crater is blasting material out, it's skimming material off the side and throwing it out on the sides there. And when the energy starts to just away, just about be dissipated, that last little flap will collapse down like that and it'll give you basically an overturned stratigraphy. And that is in fact what we drilled our M4 core, core through right through there. So we got all these neat things and we can put together this great crater story. And uh, this is kind of a, a newer illustration of what our crater looks like in cross section. Well, how did it form? I put together this little cartoon type thing that kind of shows what happened beginning about 73 million years ago. A meteor came shooting it down and splash, hit the earth. 
And I've got a little clock up there that shows you how long it takes these things to happen. Zero seconds it hits. Well, what happens is that meteor pa penetrates basically its own diameter into the Earth. When it hit, it hits, it sends a shock wave down and a shock wave up through the meteorite. And as that meteorite penetrates to about its own diameter into the Earth, that shock wave hits the back surface and the whole thing explodes. An incredible explosion, the equivalent of uh, what is that? 1.7 times 10 to the 75 <laughs> tons or something. Oh, I, that's 17 trillion cubic tons of material were, were blasted out of that hole. That, that's what that number is for. I just put that on there, forgot about it. That basically vaporized the entire meteorite at about one and a half times the meteorite's mass in Earth material, shot all that stuff high up into the atmosphere. That, that was by about 15 hundredths of a second. By about six tenths of a second, that crater had grown to five miles wide and would be two and a half miles deep because it's a hemisphere as it grows. And everything inside of that crater that wasn't vaporized and thrown out would be melted and thrown out as glass thrown out of the crater. A total of 375 trillion tons of Earth material. A lot of stuff. The crater then continued to grow, reached its maximum depth about 6.9 seconds, maximum depth somewhere around five miles, somewhere in that general area. Uh, from then on, it didn't grow as a hemisphere anymore. It grew outward, didn't have enough energy left to continue to go down, but it continued to grow outward as a, as a hyperboloid, actually, until it reaches its maximum depth, the maximum size hole blown out of the ground at 25 seconds after the initial impact. You can see the Phanerozoic class breccias being thrown out as a surge deposits on the side here. Uh, the, the energy is dissipated enough that these sides are starting to collapse down. You get a little hint of the central peak forming, but then it really forms after that energy is really gone. Water starts to come back in, picks up all of that surge material, carries it back in as a resurge material, and fills up the crater. So. A couple months after the crater, you would have had something that looked like an atoll sitting out there in the, in the Cretaceous Seaway. After that, it was mostly erosion in our history. So it got eroded, we eroded, eroded down about 1,100 feet of uh, original material and down to the level that it is now. The glaciers moved in, put down a layer of glacial till, and it left us with what we see today. Now, if we go back and look at that original crater, we see that uh, that much material was vaporized and blown out of the crater up into the upper atmosphere, rained down as little beads of, of glass. Total of 1.6 cubic miles of material was vaporized, of the, of the meteorite itself was vaporized, and uh, about one and a half times that much earth material. Then uh, everything inside of this area was melted and thrown out as glass, molten material out of the crater. Everything inside here was broken up and thrown out as blocks out of the crater. And this is what they called the, the squish zone, for lack of something better. That's basically the area that was pushed down, that was lifted up on the sides, that eventually collapsed back down to push up the central peak. So that's the Manson Crater, but just exactly how old is it? I said we found that, that sanidine material, and uh, that's what it looked like, that little white dot there. Uh, that was studied by, by uh, Dr. Glenn Isaiah of the U.S. Geological Survey, and he came up with a lay uh, argon 4039 age of uh, 73.8 million years. So, uh, as he would say, the Manson impact is not coeval with the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. This was about 9 million years before that final KT boundary. And he said that this must have struck in an ocean area. And this was kind of important because uh, he was also working with another fella looking at the age of some of the Cretaceous rocks, uh, basically based on, on uh, volcanic ash, et cetera. And uh, sure enough, out in the western part of the U.S., he found a unit called the Crow Creek that was the same age as a Manson. So he went out there and looked in the Crow Creek, and he found shot quartz. So this is Manson shot quartz that was found in the Crow Creek unit. Uh, subsequently, they did a new age on, uh, on the Manson Rock, came up with something a little older. 
uh, 74.1 million years. And then this turned out to be the same age as they assigned to that Crow Creek unit. So that Crow Creek unit was part of the seafloor at the time that Manson was hit and this material came, came falling in. So what do we know about that Manson ejecta? I said that was a Crow Creek unit. Well, a Manson crater would have blasted a debris cloud out, something like that. And uh, as it eroded away, it left behind that little area that we see in dark yellow there that uh, corresponds to where we currently know the Crow Creek is, and that's where we found it. And uh, since we knew where that Crow Creek was, we had to go out and see for ourselves if, <clears throat> in fact, that does have Manson Rock in it. So over the course of a couple field seasons, we managed to hammer down this hole through limestone, I might say, uh, a lot of work, and sampled it all the way down, and we found lots of shocked quartz grains, all right. These are apparently Manson shock quartz grains. But <clears throat> even more convincing, we found things like this Paleozoic dolomite. This is this is uh, Ordovician dolomite that was probably came came from quite the, far down in the, in, in the Manson crater. And there's no dolomite anywhere like that anywhere around here. That grain would have easily dissolved away before it was transported any distance. We also found uh, glauconite, which is a mineral that's found in the Cambrian rocks in that area. So these are other minerals beside the shock quartz that were thrown out of the Manson crater. So we're pretty sure that, in fact, that Crow Creek is Manson ejecta. Well, we've talked about extinctions. Uh, we didn't kill all the dinosaurs, but we certainly got a lot of them. Uh, did we cause any extinctions? Well, if we take a look at the vertebrate fossils that were around at that time, we see there were some that died out, just about coincident with that Manson impact there. Hadrosaurs, that's where these dinosaurs, they, they ended about that same time. Pachycephalosaurs, these guys with the funny helmets on their head, they died out about that time. These giant Dinosuchus crocodiles also died out about then. And then a lot of these centrosaurs also died, most of the, the Centrosaur genuses died out at that same time, but some of them carried over. Well, so there's a lot of extinctions about them, but that's a, a fairly wide time range, and is that abnormal? No, don't think so. So we really can't say that there were for sure any extinction caused by the Manson impact. What were the effects of the Manson impact? Well, if we look at the Tunguska blast, this is a meteorite that exploded. Uh, it didn't really hit, it exploded in the atmosphere above Russia in 1908, but it has a big one, and that's the biggest recent uh, event like this that we have to draw comparison to. So we use this as an example. This blasted a bunch of trees over, created a little crater. Uh, it was estimated the energy of Tunguska somewhere between 10 and 42 kilotons, and uh, the atomic bombs we dropped on Japan were 13 and 22, respectively, so uh, we're in the same range as those atomic bombs at Tunguska. So what do we have at Manson? We estimated about 5.5 billion kilotons of energy released at Manson, so that's somewhere on the order of 200 to 500,000 times more than Tunguska. So this scaling upwards doesn't always work great in all, but it gives you a rough idea of what the effects of the Manson impact, if that happened exactly the same spot today, would be. So there's the crater. The first thing that would have happened is this big electromagnetic pulse would have come out, a big release of electromagnetic energy. It would have basically set fire to everything inside of that yellow circle. So most of Iowa would have been burned up, just about to Iowa City, as a matter of fact. Everything in, within that circle, the trees would have been blown over, and that's as far away as Chicago, St. Louis, Ogallala. Trees would have been blown over away from the blast, that far away. And in the, Tungus in the Tunguska blast, there was a trader who was riding his horse through the forest at the time, and the shock wave actually knocked him unconscious. So if we scale that up, we would have people being knocked unconscious as far away as Pittsburgh, Atlanta, Albuquerque, Salt Lake City. And you don't have to get too much closer to be dead, so we just split the differences. So an earthquake, an impact like that today would probably kill pretty much everybody between Columbus, Ohio, and Denver, Colorado. So it would have been a big deal. Uh, it's interesting. There's a site on the Internet called uh, uh, Computer Impact Effects. Uh, site, and, and uh, here's a URL for it if you're, if you're interested. But anyway, you can punch in a bunch of the parameters and see how that impact would affect you uh, at your given distance from where it hit. So I punched all of the 
information for Manson in just to see what would happen here 155 miles away uh, if that hit today. The air blast would have arrived at about 70, 756 seconds, so that's about 12 minutes that the blast would have come, would have hit us. And it would have hit with an energy of 11.6 pounds per square inch. Well, what does that mean? If we look at this little chart we, here, we see that at 10 pounds per square inch, most combustible materials ignite. So uh, most everything around here would have been blasted and a, a little more than that, 98% fatalities. So most everybody here would have, would have been killed. Not only that, 330 mile an hour winds, sound intensity of 9.8 decibels, it would have been a big blast. Masonry buildings, wooden frame buildings, glass, glass windows, trees blowing off, it would have been a pretty horrible experience to be around here then. Well, this is an aerial photograph of Iowa City and uh, you are here. This is Iowa City Library, meeting room A. We zoom back a little bit and if that meteorite came crashing right down on top of you and set right on top of this building, that's how big it would be. See, it goes out almost to the field house over here, almost up to the Park Road Bridge, up to the Highway 6 Bridge down here, would cover a good part of Iowa City. And uh, when that hit and released its energy, it would have been a big boom. There's a map that shows the meteorite in black right in the center sitting there. This area around there would have been vaporized totally, blasted into the atmosphere. That area would have been melted and thrown out of the crater as molten rock. So, you know, you're quite a ways out already. This material would have been pulverized and thrown out as fragments of rock. So you've got all of Iowa City, Coralville, University Heights, you're almost up to hills. And then here, this would have been uplifted and then collapsed down inside here. So the eventual crater would have gone all the way from Riverside to Shueyville, from, from uh, Springville to Oxford. It would have been a huge crater. It would have looked something like this. But it turns out that the actual dinosaur killer was a Chicxulub crater right down here. And uh, Bill Bryson wrote an interesting book, in, uh, A Short History of Nearly Everything. And in writing that book, he actually stopped by the Iowa Survey and he interviewed us and talked with us about Manson. So it was a nice chapter about us and, and Manson in there. But he also talked about this book, Night Comes to the Cretaceous by Lawrence Powell. And Lawrence Powell estimated the Chicxulub impact was about 100 billion megatons. And there's Manson over there at 5.5 billion megatons by comparison. So how big is 100 billion megatons? This is the blast that actually killed the dinosaurs. Well, if you exploded one Hiroshima-sized atomic bomb, that's 15 kilotons, for every living person on Earth, you'd come up a billion bombs short. So that's a lot of energy. And I saw another one not too long ago that I thought was another good comparison. Explode one megaton nuclear bomb, that's about 70 Hiroshimas, every four miles over the entire Earth would be an equivalent amount of energy. So let's look at Johnson County here. Every four miles will explode a one megaton bomb. <laughs> Can you imagine that spread over the whole Earth? These meteorites just have just incredible amounts of energy. When will another one occur? Well, uh, fortunately, Gene Shoemaker, before he passed away, and his wife and others had been studying just exactly that. They're looking for Earth-crossing asteroids, asteroids which might cross the orbit of the Earth and might collide with us. And they came up with this number. They say one the size of Manson will probably occur about every nine million years, and it'll hit the continental landmass about every three. Uh, huh. About every three million years. One Chicxulub size happens about once every hundred million years, and it would impact land about once every 287 million years. Well, we have one thing to remember Manson by. Uh, the latest U-Haul graphic that they came out with about uh, 10 years ago shows Manson. And so here it is. And we got to, got to work with this fellow when he designed this thing. It was pretty neat. It shows these asteroids coming in, shows a Manson crater getting blasted there, and it shows a cross-section, kind of like the one that I had with the uplifted central peak and all of that. And, uh, and these corn stalks out here that, uh, let's see, to scale would be about, about 10 miles high. So this is, in fact, a tall corn state. 
Uh, and he also wanted an equation. So you see this little equation out here. That's, that's one that I gave him for the ballistic distance that material thrown out of the crater will fly depending on the angle of ejection and the energy and that sort of thing. So when you see that going down the road, uh, that's what you'll, you'll see. Okay, so we talked about Manson. Let's talk about Decorah impact structure. This is 112 miles to the north, uh, right under the sleepy town of Decorah. If you're not familiar with that town, it's uh, famous for nice old buildings. It's famous for Decorah College. And of course, the Upper Iowa River, beautiful Upper Iowa River, runs right through it, very scenic cliffs. So that's Decorah. Uh, there's a town of Decorah, uh, kind of a, a 3D view, and uh, a crater is right under this part of it, about three miles wide. Nobody knew about that, except we did know that there was some funky water in that area. Funk well, the, the first time that we got any indication of something weird going on up there, they thought it was a fault zone through there, so they actually called it the Decorah Fault because a well encountered the uh, same unit two different times. You pass through the Oneota there, and the Oneota there, and the Red Valley there, and the Reed Valley there, and the Willow River here, and the Willow River there. So it went through the same unit twice. That was the interpretation. Turns out that was wrong, but that at least told us there was something weird going on. Then when the Skyline Quarry was drilled right here, this Skyline Quarry hole is right in the center of where the Manson structure is in a quarry. And uh, holy cow, it looked weird. This is what the geology should look like. This is a Cresco well nearby. That's what geology should look like. This is what it did look like. Everything is kind of similar right up to that point. You know, what's all this stuff below here? We didn't, we've never seen anything like that. Well, one thing that uh, was going on about that time, just prior to the, the St. Peter sandstone moving in, is there was a really low stand in the oceans. There were deep river valleys cut everywhere, and including some that we see up in this area. So you get real deep river valleys cut into the channels. And maybe this was a river valley filled with river material. Uh, it's what's called the, the Reedstown, and uh, the Reedstown member is what fills that, and the Tanti member of the St. Peter, it's called. Uh, it's strange that uh, that's what they saw, but when we start looking at, at the geology in that area, we, we see that, uh, in fact, there really aren't any channels running into there. There are no channels coming in, no channels going out, just this one spot. So it wasn't a channel. What could it be? Well, we got a little more weird information from uh, a lady that lived up there that has been a good friend of ours for many years, a uh, uh, 60s hippie from Iowa City who moved up there. And she was a geology major, so she's interested in geology. And she found these old newspaper clippings about there being coal up in that area. Well, you know, there weren't any trees around at that, that time that the rocks were deposited there. So why could there be coal? Uh, so we thought we got these three different newspaper reports. The one from the state geologist at the time, Sam Calvin, said it probably was carried down by the glaciers. Uh, who knows? But we got kind of curious about that and, and went looking for it. And uh, sure enough, right here, this is just east of Decorah, uh, and there's a little exposure right along the river there that has these strange rocks that are actually very gray shale and it doesn't fit in anywhere else. And so some of our people went out to get it. This is uh, uh, Bob McKay and Tom Marshall, our survey geologists. Derek Briggs is a geologist from Yale University and Peabody Museum. Uh, he was out looking at these rocks too. And we found these rocks here. And it turns out that uh, this is some weird shale. So we went to find out what it was. So we actually got enough money to drill a drill hole up there and try to get a sample of it. And uh, that's St. Peter Sandstone and deposited on top of the crater in the background there. And when we drilled through, we drilled through a little bit of that St. Peter, and then boom, we hit this contact here of all of this black shale. And if we started looking at other water wells in the area, which wells had black shale in them and which ones didn't? Well, the ones that had black shale in it are these green ones, and the ones that didn't are the red ones. So you could draw a nice circle right around those green things. Huh. A three-mile diameter circle, how about that? And uh, so if we look at the bedrock geology map, a more detailed map that we did up in that area, we find there is one unit right in here that we've called the Winnesheek Shale, and it only is exposed in one spot. It's buried under, under, under the river deposits everywhere else. Uh, so that's what we call the Winnesheek Shale. 
Now we put together kind of based on these wells and stuff what we thought was a, a little schematic of the crater and uh, that's kind of what it looked like. We'd expect the crater to be much deeper at this, this amount of vertical exaggeration. No crater is that, no impact crater is that shallow. We expect it to be much deeper, but we had this one well right in the center here that seems to indicate the bottom of the crater is right there, or down a little more, my line must have shifted. But uh, so, so what's going on? We really never have figured that out. The fellow that, that looked at the samples from that drilling uh, was around when they drilled the hole and knows that material better than anything else, actually studied those samples on two separate occasions, and he's convinced that's what we have. So uh, pretty weird geology going on there. Well, how do we know it's an impact? Well, we find a lot of these really intensely fractured quartz grains in there. Some of them have very unique fracture sets like that. So it turns out there was a fellow working for the Smithsonian Bevin French is a very famous impact worker who'd been studying this, these kind of features in a Wisconsin crater, so we got him to look at them, and he says those are produced by a hypervelocity impact. So he agrees that's a that was an impact crater. And on top of that, we got looking at more samples, and we saw some of them had these little areas right here when you blow them up. Those are classic shocked quartz grains, parallel deformation features, only produced by meteor impacts. and that sliding of the quartz along the crystallographic axes. So it turns out that the core impact structure became the 184th known impact structure on Earth. Now it's also interesting that there is a number of other impact structures around that same age. And all those dots that you see there are impact structures that are known to be about the same age. The yellow one is a decora structure, and this is superimposed on a map of what the continents look like. Uh, 458 million years ago when, when that impact occurred. So you've got this whole string of, of impact rock, of impact craters all looking the same. Interestingly, if you go over here into these in Norway, particularly the Thorsberg quarry, they quarry limestone there for building blocks, etc. And in the limestone, they actually find preserved meteorites. These are ones that must have broken off the main body as it came in and, and hit with enough velocity they didn't explode and were just incorporated in the limestone. So we know exactly the age because they're right there in the rock. We know exactly what type of meteorite they are because we can sample them. And they turn out to be these L-chondrites, which is a kind of a chondritic meteorite. And these are, represent 34% of all meteorites on Earth are L-chondrites. Furthermore, those meteorites tell us a story. They tell us about the main asteroid belt, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and uh, sometime about 460 million years ago, a couple of asteroids in the main asteroid belt crashed together and broke apart with incredible energy and rained down on the Earth. And that's what caused this meteorite crater. We see, um, we see the rock elm structure and, and uh, and Wisconsin is the same age, AIM structures, state, Slate Islands quarry, and then several other ones around. And if we look, something else that was going on about that period of time was a great extinction event right here. The Ordovician Silurian extinction event, the second largest of the five major extinction events. So it could be that this was a case where a lot of smaller meteorites falling in helped to cause a major extinction event. Well, we said that the deposit where you can find these rocks is located right there. The river makes a little bend, and if we cross the river a couple times and go over here by the golf course, we can find some limestone bluffs exposed. And this is Ordovician Oneota dolomite, and uh, Paul Liu, one of the geologists, sat in there beside it. And if you look at the structure in these rocks, you see they're bent over like that. These rocks were actually curved over by the blast of the meteor when it hit. So we know that the actual edge of the crater runs sometime somewhere between those two spots right there. Plus the, the material that filled that crater, this unusual black shale that shows up nowhere else, we call it the Winnesheek Shale, turns out to be a very unique rock. It's what we call a Lagerstaden. It preserves an incredible uh, array of fossils that is totally unlike you find in most places. Tra trilobites, crapt <laughs> graptolites, trilobites, 
corals, bryzoans, uh, eurypterids, all kinds of interesting things found in there. Uh, much better preserved than you normally find things preserved. This is a definition of a Lagerstaden, and this is certainly fits that bill. You just see incredibly preserved things in there. So with that information, we got together a National Science Foundation grant uh, supported by all of these various groups, and we spent several years sampling those rocks. What they actually had to do is build a little coffer dam here so they could pump that water out and actually get down in there and sample that rock all the way through the section, or at least part way through the section, as far as they could keep the water pumped out. So they collected a lot of these rocks. You see, they're little thin layered units like that. And they collected, I forget, I think they had 5,000 pounds worth of of, of these rocks collecting these little blue tubs and they had to keep them wet because the shale disintegrated when it dried out. They took those things back to Iowa City and studied them, every little sample under the microscope to, to look at the, what fossils and stuff were there. And one of the things they found were these, these black guys. See those little black streaks there? Those are carbon films from a critter called a eurypterid. This is what a eurypterid looks like. It was like a sea scorpion. Uh, there's so many of these in some areas of that rock, so much of this eurypterid carbon that you can take a match and light the rock on fire. It'll burn. And that's probably where the idea that that was coal came from. Well, it turns out there were all of these other, other weird animals in there too, uh, mostly dominated by conodonts. Conodonts are these little jawless fish. Uh, they look something like that, we think. There's only been a few uh, whole animals found. I mean a few, I mean maybe six found in the whole earth ever. And uh, we think there are several of them here. So we're pretty excited about that. That's one that they think is a, is a full preserved conodont there. We also found some interesting things. These are what you usually find preserved in a conodont. A conodont's a soft body animal. It doesn't usually preserve. What preserves it is a little phosphate teeth on the thing, and they have a very complex set of teeth. And uh, this was one complex we found where these all together as part of one animal, but in the past, these two had been described as a different animal, a coleostis, and these guys described the uh, uh, archaeonathids. Uh, so we know from studying these rocks that these two are actually the same animal rather than two separate fossils. And there's all of these other things. These are, are bromelites. These are or basically uh, animal poop that was discovered there. And, and by studying that, you can learn a lot about the types of animals and the preservation, et cetera. So these are what the eurypterids look like. The uh, National Geographic did a show called The Strange Truth, The Day the Sky Fell. And that was shown on National Geographic Channel. You can still find it if you want to look, at, uh, look it up on the internet. That was the size of those critters, six feet, a six foot scorpion swimming around there. These were not only the oldest of these eurypterids found anywhere on earth, these were among the biggest. So that was a pretty cool. So we actually learned this one more thing about those, that Decora impact structure. We were working with the US Geological Survey studying these rocks up here in this area. This is called the Decora, uh, the Northeast Iowa Plutonic Complex. There are a bunch of rocks that were intruded into the ground about a billion years ago. The same age as the rocks up in Duluth area called the Duluth Complex that are worth literally hundreds of billions of dollars for the mineral resources in it. And a lot of them are strategic <laughs> and critical minerals. The so US Geological Survey wondered if in fact these had the same thing. So we've been kind of running a study to see what's there. And as a part of that study, we did a little aerial survey up in that area there. We did gravity and magnetics, did a gravity survey with this airborne gravitometer and a resistivity survey with this helicopter borne resistivity unit. So we were basically looking at the, the gravity characteristics, the magnetic characteristics, and the, the resistivity to, to electri electricity flow in the ground in this area using these platforms. The gravity survey showed us uh, what, what is the crater. I don't think we'd identify that necessarily as a crater if we didn't know, but it does have a low spot right in the center. But the resistivity model really showed up because the shales that are in the center of there 
uh, are very carbon rich and stuff, conduct a lot of electricity easily. So they are higher conductors and the area around the outside is, is a lesser conductor. So it really shows the shape of that, that crater and that, that circle that's drawn on there was really the one that we did mapping out the, the wells, et cetera, is superimposed right on top of there, a perfect fit. So that made everybody excited to learn a lot more about those structures. So uh, that's, that's the end of my talk. This is a little sign that Manson has uh, right now. It's pretty cool. Uh, like I said, I've got a few samples from uh, the Manson structure up here. I didn't think to bring any of the decora things, but they're just little ugly shale things. There's not much to see. <laughs> Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions anybody might have. Yes, sir. You've got to use the microphone. Hold on so the people at home can hear your question. Oh, I'm sorry. What was the depth of the water that the Manson, Manson object fell through? Okay, the question is, what is the depth of the water that Manson impact fell through? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we don't really know for sure, but we talk about it being shallow marine, so we'd guess it's maybe a couple hundred feet or something like that. That Cretaceous Seaway ran all the way from the Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic Ocean at one time, and it was mostly very shallow water the whole distance. Any other questions? Oh, come on. <laughs> You're too good at what you do, right? Yeah, that might be it. Well, I'll tell you, this is a really interesting study, and, and if I had uh, another career as a geologist, I could just pick up on Manson and study for another 40 years. There's so much more to be learned about it. It's so unique in a lot of ways. The town of Manson gets its naturally soft water out of that central uplifted peak, and it turns out that that water uh, actually came in just before the glaciers did and filled up that, that peak that was just barely at the surface and uh, then the glaciers covered it all up, and so that's basically two million year old water that they're drinking up there. And right now they're trying to find a, an additional well. They have two wells now that are about 30 feet apart. One of them is starting to go to pot because it was drilled in 1905. That's maybe the oldest well in Iowa by a, by a long shot, I think. And uh, they've drilled seven drill holes all around that area. I haven't found water yet. So how these guys showed up on a prairie and said drill here and hit water the first time, probably somebody with a witching stick, you know. <laughs> now, Ray did bring some core samples here, but if you haven't been upstairs recently, right next to the reference desk are our two glass display cases full of meteorites. And they are, majority of them are from Ray's collection, but he also finagled some from various museums and places. So right upstairs on the second floor, and they're all labeled and have all these signs explaining everything that you know, he did. So. I should also mention that I am, I am here technically under the auspices of the Cedar Valley Rock and Mineral Association, which is a or society, which is a rock club up in Cedar Rapids, and, and I've been a member of that since I, since I retired. We do a lot, a lot of neat things, and if you're interested in rocks at all, come on up. <laughs> well, oh, Jeanette has one. Did the glaciers have any effect on any of this, or is everything underneath? And now, the glaciers had no effect on any of this, except they probably plowed away some of the material and leveled it out, and then buried it so we can't see it. You know, if that would have been exposed at the land surface, we would have had bad lands. <laughs> Topography we wouldn't have a nice fertile crop, but we'd have a great tourist attraction. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Ray. This was amazingly interesting, and. Ray is doing a second program next month. I have to look at my list. On Iowa meteorites. Iowa meteorites, We've had yes. nine meteorites in Iowa's history. These are two of them. I'll talk a little bit about these, but we've had seven others that are actually physical meteorites you could hold in your hand. And uh, the theme of our, our rock show that our organization has up in Cedar Rapids every spring, you've probably seen the rock show, is gonna be meteorites, and I'm gonna to try to get together a collection of, of uh, an example of every meteorite that's been found in Iowa. So, hey, get up there if you can. Well, thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. Thank you.